Hello and welcome in everyone. We're so pleased that you're joining us this afternoon. For those of you in the Western Hemisphere and in the morning, for those of you in the East, uh, we're continuing our Global Ag Investing webinar series with a very exciting presentation on investing in Australian agriculture. We're hosted today by Elders Rural Services, and we're thrilled to have Mark Barber with us representing Elders. We also have Andrew Whitelaw and Matt Dalglish from uh, Thomas Elder Markets, which is an independent uh, market intelligence arm of Elders. So we're going to do a presentation. Each of them are going to talk you through a, a different segment of Australian agriculture, um, and we're focusing a lot on, on protein today. And then at the end, I'll come back and we'll do some, some Q&A uh, with our great speakers. And I hope that you'll contribute to that. You can put them into the Q&A chat box and I will get to those um, as we come to the close of the presentation. So again, we're delighted to have all of you with us. Thank you for spending an hour of your day. And thank you so much to all of you for being here to deliver the presentation. I'm going to do a screen share to pull it up. And then Matt, I'm going to let you take it away. No problems. Whenever you're ready, Matt, go yeah. right ahead. So um, thanks for that, Kate, and I, our team really appreciates GAI's work they put in to get this webinar up and running. Just a quick outline of what we're going to cover off. So I'll just uh, spend some time quickly on the current red meat opportunities with a real view on the Australian context and a, a focus on both beef and sheep meat, but a particular um, focus on the sheep meat um, section because that's um, an area that we think is uh, worthy of attention. Andrew Whitelaw... We'll then uh, move on to give us an indication as to uh, what's the implication for the grain sector. And in particular, he's going to have a focus um, on the domestic use and the feed grain use within Australia based around what the opportunities are for the red meat space. And Mark will uh, finish up with um, some you know, key considerations, uh, looking at some of the uh, historics of, of what's been going on in um, a couple of key sections of Australian agriculture and just some... Um, finish off with some of, the, some of the aspects of what you really need to consider when you're looking at um, an Australian ag investment. All right, so I'll just start off with the beef supply and the global context. With regards to the global herd, we're looking at about one point. 5 billion head. Um, since the 60s, the growth rates, annual average growth rates in the, in the beef herd globally has been pretty steady and you're looking at about a 0.8% growth. When we focus in on the Australian uh, proportion of the beef herd, we can see that uh, Australia is back down the list at about 12th spot. And uh, that represents about 2% of glo the global herd and about 4% of global production. So um, on, on the first appearance here, it looks as though Australia is not much of a significant player, but um, interestingly, when you actually take a look at exportable product, um, the situation changes quite drastically. And, and part of that reason is because of Australia's low population. We do have and, and have had for many, many, many decades now quite a high exportable surplus of beef, um, such that in 2019, we were the second largest exporter of beef product to the world um, behind Brazil. If we contrast that to sheep supply, um, there's a bit more variation in the sheep flock through the years. Um, but like the beef side, uh, we are at record levels in terms of sheep flock, uh, just over 1.2 billion head. Um, and why that is, is an interesting kind of um, scenario with, with them both being at, at, at high levels uh, in terms of flock and herd. Uh, the interesting part of the, of the sheep dynamic is when you take into account the key exporting nations, so the top 10 exporting nations for sheep meat, the, the, pitch, the pitch is very different in terms of supply. And you can see from about the 90s, there's been a steady decline uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the sheep flock of those exporting nations. Uh, 
Uh, and in the last decade or so, we've seen it, it, it plateau at just under 20, 250 million head of, of sheep globally that's, um, that's available for export. If we drill down further into those broader numbers, so looking again at the global picture, uh, the top 15 countries for, for sheep flock, uh, if you take a look at that and see how many of those top 15 countries actually do export, you can see it's only four of the countries that are key exporters. And, and just taking a bit more of a look at those four or, or just those exporting nations, uh, if you look back at the last decade or so, it's very, very much dominated by Australia and New Zealand uh, as exporting nations. Uh, on average, on any given year for the last 10 years or so, more than 70% of global sheep meat exports have come from either Australia or New Zealand combined. Uh, more, in more recent years, the ratio is about 40% is supplied by Australia and about 30% supplied by New Zealand. So the takeout from a supply perspective there is that um, a bit, it's a bit different to the beef space in that there's um, much fewer competitors in the sheep meat space. It's much more a niche market. And we believe that's one of the key reasons why there's a lot of opportunity there for, for, for added growth in this sector, which I'll, I'll go to outline now. So if we just focus in on uh, the, the Australian context, uh, looking at our level of exports as a proportion of our production each year. For, for beef, it's been a fairly steady rise through the last two decades. Uh, if you look at the, the, the dotted trend line, you can see it's gone from about 60% through to um, around 70% of our, of our production uh, domestically that gets exported. So heavily export focused nation for beef, and that's been the case uh, for quite a few decades. So it's really reflective of quite a mature uh, but competitive market um, for the Australian um, beef producer and for the Australian exporter of beef. When we take a look at the situation for lamb and mutton, so the sheep meat side of things with regards to exports as a, as a share of production, we can see the growth over the last two decades or so has been much more um, rapid, I guess, if, if, if you uh, for want of a, a description. And we can see back in the mid 90s, it's gone from about 40% uh, of, of, of production was exported uh, to in recent times up, up around that 70%. So starting to mirror the same type of export focus that we've seen uh, in the beef market or it's been existing in the beef market for quite a few decades. Um, underpinning that, that growth uh, in the sheep meat space has been uh, obviously the, the, the um, aspect of uh, the growth in Southeast Asia in demand for meat proteins of all types fairly well known. Uh, but Australia has been able to um, capture some of that, that market given um, how much of a, uh, an important uh, proportion we have of, of sheep meat exports globally and our proximity to Southeast Asia. But the market's quite diverse. So we've got you know, quite a good market into North America and also into the Middle East. And, and um, with the um, alterations to, to Brexit in Europe, that there's a market potential there as well for continued growth. So the picture in our view for sheep meat is that um, if you're looking at two red meat proteins, uh, we feel there's still more potential for growth in that sector uh, over the next few decades. If we have a look domestically and see what this means for, for prices, and I've taken the uh, um, Eastern States Trade Lamb Indicator as a, as a bit of a benchmark uh, pricing indicator for, for the sheep meat market in Australia. Uh, if you like to think of it as, as kind of like a Dow Jones, uh, what Dow Jones does for equities as an indicator, the ESTLI is a fairly commonly referenced indicator just to give a feel for what's happening in the broader sheep meat space. And we can see over the last two decades, we have had um, three significant periods of, of growth in prices. And um, part of that growth in prices, or a good proportion of what's driving those growth in prices has been uh, this underlying um, expansion of the, of the um, sheep meat export sector. Uh, you can see the forecast range for the next couple of years is a bit of uh, sideways price consolidation. And sheep meat's one of those commodities from a global perspective, it's very susceptible to global downturn. So with the, the current climate um, around many parts of the world with, with COVID impacting economic growth, um, the forecast is for, for a bit of sideways price action, uh, not dissimilar to the type of sideways price action we saw just post the GFC, where we, where we had through that 2009, 10, 11 period uh, with a very high Australian dollar, uh, we, we had a bit of a sideways price movement for, 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 um, for the ESTLI. Uh, we're looking at that for the next couple of years while we work through globally this, um, this situation with COVID. But as we've seen, uh, if we look at those growth phases, we've seen those three big growth phases uh, through, which, which is underpinned by that export market growth. 
uh, our expectation is as we head to the to the middle of this decade, uh, you know, 2023, 24 and beyond, that we're going to look to go into another significant period of growth phase, probably not dissimilar to what we saw uh, most recently through 2014 to 2019. Uh, and the takeout from that is, is that, you know, forecast wise, uh, towards the end of the decade, uh, or the latter part of the decade, it wouldn't be, um, it, it'd be a fairly reasonable assumption to, to be looking at Eastern States trade lane indicator at above uh, $11 a kilo carcass weight, even touching as high as $12 a kilo carcass weight. So that's going to um, send a fairly strong signal uh, to producers within Australia to continue to grow um, and, and look towards uh, sheep meat as a very um, solid investment uh, for the next decade or so at least. If we just, uh, my last slide here before I pass to Andrew, I'll have a, a quick look at the dynamic of what's been happening with regards to grain fed operations and, and moving back to beef and looking over the last two decades as to what's happened um, with, this, with the gradual shift from uh, grass fed finishing to grain fed finishing. You can see in the early part of the 2000s, uh, grain fed operations were about 25% of Australian turn off of beef. And through the years, we've seen a fairly steady increase such that just this year, we're forecasting about 41% of Australian production will be finished in a, in a grain fed um, system. Part of the move there is uh, in the production side of things is to get a bit more control around um, the finishing process. Uh, Australia, obviously very susceptible to um, the um, randomness of the weather and, and droughts is something that Australia is very familiar with, but from a pasture based production system, uh, drought isn't your friend. Um, so just to be able to you know, secure that supply chain a bit more, there's been this growing trend towards uh, grain fed as a finishing system. And another part that's um, been underpinning uh, the growth in that sector as well has been uh, with the increase of, um, of an appetite, particularly in Northern Asia and in Japan's a key uh, export destination for Australian beef, very much um, uh, in tune with the gra grain fed system and, and the high value branded beef. So there's been a lot of growth in that sector and, and in more recent years, um, China's uh, starting to move towards a more branded high value product from Australia. So the growth in that demand for that branded high, 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 high value beef um, has also been, um, has been underpinning some of this move towards uh, the grain fed operation. Uh, just again, so that um, exporters and, and producers of that product can make sure that they can um, fulfil commitments in terms of their export contracts. So just finishing up with where does it, where does this fit in and what does it mean for sheep? Um, historically in Australia, um, the only time you really have been finishing um, sheep on grain has been during periods of drought when it was a necessity. Uh, our view is though at Thomas Elder Markets is, is over the next decade as that sheep meat space grows, uh, continues to grow from an export perspective and continues to attract uh, these higher and higher prices uh, through that growth phase, that there is going to be a real um, economic uh, uh, push or, or an imperative uh, to, to make sure that that supply chain for sheep is also being secured like we've seen for beef. And so our view is that we're going to actually start to go into more dedicated um, uh, systems of, of sheep feedlot finishing uh, and, and, and a similar scenario with what we've seen with the growth in um, feedlots for for beef and that has some significant implications for uh, the grain sector and with that um, I'll pass across to uh, to Andrew and um, and he can take us through the grain uh, implications. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. That's a really good segue, uh, the increase in cattle on feed uh, for, for what I'm going to be talking about. And that is the, the change in the change in how grain is used within, within Australia. The more cattle we need on feed, the more grain that we require to feed those animals. So it's going to be a bit of an introduction into the, the grains industry. So as a nation, Australia is a large producer of wheat with a very small population uh, is growing, but, but definitely nowhere near um, the level where we can consume all we uh, produce within the country. So to give you a typical indication, we are a producer of around about Uh, 10 to 15% of the global wheat trade. And this is 
basically a, a figure which is dropping substantially over time. And we've actually seen that we've gone from 10, uh, 15, uh, averaging around about that sort of 15 to 10%. And now we're actually starting to see periods of where we're actually dropping below that 10%. And in the last couple of years during the drought, we only contributed around about 5% to global trade. <clears throat> we expect that this will continue falling, our reliance on overseas exports and our, our contribution to the overall wheat trade for two main reasons. First of all, being that we've got larger competitors with the likes of the Black Sea nations, which are producing vast quantities of grain. But secondly, and, and the focus largely of, of the rest of this presentation is domestic demand. <clears throat> so this is just a quick chart to basically demonstrate as, an, as a nation the way our figures are going. What we can see is as a percentage of our total production, we're seeing the exports are gradually dropping. However, at the same time, we're seeing that domestic consumption rising. However, it's important that we look at what the composition of that demand is and where it's located. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at breaking this down into its component parts, because when we look at the overall domestic demand and exports, there's a couple of little curly things uh, within that data that you have to be aware of. So first of all, we have to think of Australia really not as a country, but as a continent. We are a huge country and it's very different between different parts of the nation. So we really are talking about a story of exports versus domestics. Western Australia ha has grown rapidly over the past uh, century to take over a larger and larger percentage of Australia's wheat production. In the last couple of years, we've seen uh, the average above 40% of the national wheat production is located within Australia. And, and even in the last couple of years during drought, we saw production in Western Australia exceed 50% uh, of the, the national production. We expect that Western Australia will continue to be an export dominated uh, part of the country. To put it into context, if we look at wheat and barley, on average, there's about 11 and a half million tonnes of, of, of both of those grains combined. So with a small, again, an even smaller population of 2.5 million, they produce about four tonnes per person of wheat and barley combined which is a lot of bread and a lot of beer. So I don't see that being uh, exhausted anytime soon. So in all likelihood, if we think of the West Coast as a export dominated area, the East Coast is what we're really focusing on. And that is where the picture changes quite significantly. The East Coast tends to be an export state in good years. However, it's becoming more and more reliant on the domestic market. So we'll start looking into the, the domestic figure here. This is the, the combined domestic demand for wheat and barley. And this includes, um, this, this data here is for the whole nation, but it includes feeding, industrial uses, uh, flour, consum uh, flour production, malting barley, etc. So this is a combined demand. So we're seeing this increasing over time, and, and especially you see a very large jump in demand in the last couple of years. And this is largely due to the, the recent droughts that we've had. And as Matt was, was, was suggesting in his, his cattle slides, there, when, when there's a drought, it's not kind on pastures and grass-fed uh, animals. So there tends to be a large jump in, in supplementary feeding. So feeding grain to, to sheep, cattle, uh, that would normally uh, require feeding. So as, as the climates change, and, and a lot of scientists expect that we will see more and more droughts in Australia, this is likely to be exacerbated. And we will start to see more periods when we do require 
additional supplementary feeding. So to get into it, we, we believe that if you're on the east coast of Australia and you are investing in, in cropping, even though you, you might not be interested in, in sheep or, or, or wool or cattle, uh, but even then, if you have a long-term investment on east coast and cropping, it will be an investment in protein. So at this point, it's good to have a look at what is the domestic demand drivers when it comes to feed. And as Matt alluded to, we've seen a large rise in the cattle on grain. And that can be seen in this chart. This chart here represents some proprietary modeling that, that we've conducted, which effectively looks at, well, what is the theoretical feed demand uh, within the East Coast of Australia? And this is looking at, well, how many kilograms of meat of each of these, um, of these animals do we produce? And how many kilograms of feed does it take to make that meat? So it probably looks a little bit better and a little bit more interesting when we look at it in this form. If we look at the yearly change in domestic demand, we can see we've had some very big bumper years uh, where, where the demand has, has risen very strongly but we've only seen a couple of years in the last decade where demand for feed has actually dropped either through uh, reduced animal numbers or, or stronger conditions in terms of um, pasture availability, which we see in 2016 on cattle and now in 2020 on cattle as well. So in terms of, to put it in even more perspective, if we look at uh, this year versus 2010, cattle on feed or the domestic demand for feed for cattle is up 39%. Chickens are, uh, are just behind at 29% and pigs are still a very solid offering at 22% up on the decade. So these are, in my view, quite considerable increases in domestic demand. And, and, they, and they are steady increases as well, which with, as Matt was saying, with the increased um, demand for our protein products, there's a higher demand for this inelastic, uh, inelastic demand for feed in order to ensure that people can meet their customer requirements. And that's why we think there will be increased intensive agriculture within Australia. So I mentioned that this was uh, exacerbated by climate and this chart here represents the gray line represents production on the east coast and the pink line represents demand for those three feed types uh, cattle pigs and chickens uh, i haven't included flour uh, so this would this demand would actually be slightly higher if we included flour or malt purposes but this is just a feed demand analysis and if we look at this period in particular, we can see that there was a, a change in circumstances in Australia where our demand did not exceeded our production for the, the recent droughts. And that has led to a supply and demand imbalance, which resulted in us requiring to bring grain from further and further afield. So we had to transport grain from uh, from Canada, from the Western Australia and ships, and from other parts of East Coast that were that had a surplus. And we expect that this will occur on a more and more regular basis over time, as as the as demand increases and droughts become potentially more common. We expect that there will be more times where we see demand outstripping production and. And that has an impact on, on local pricing. So this is the same chart for the light blue or turquoise uh, line on here. It represents basis. And basis is our premium for local pricing for wheat versus Chicago futures in this case. And what we can see is that if we look at 2014 on this chart, we saw basis levels rising quite significantly uh, because production had, had fallen during that period of, of poor production in New South Wales. However, 
when we saw in 2018, 2019, in this period here, where we had uh, the the demand exceeding supply, we saw basis levels rise exceptionally high uh, to levels that we hadn't seen uh, prior. And this is again something we expect to see more and more often, but it becomes an opportunity for um, for cropping investments in Australia, because if we expect that we're going to see more periods of um, deficit in, in the East Coast, as and we see this inelastic demand for feed continue, we expect that that provides opportunities for things such as long-term storage of grains, especially whilst cash is relatively cheap. Uh, we, we've seen this already in, in examples of, of small-scale farmers holding on to grains for five years and, and having relatively healthy returns from that. The other option as well is it does have a requirement for longer supply chains. So for instance, um, parts of Western districts of Victoria are, are notoriously reliable grain producing areas. So that provides opportunities for, for selling into these northern markets where the bulk of, of demand lies. This uh, over, over time, we will see a lower reliance on overseas uh, markets to, to determine our prices. Uh, this chart here represents the annual average futures as a percentage over price in, in the grey bars, along with basis as a percentage of the price in pink, uh, along with uh, in that turquoise uh, colour, the, the, the overall demand for the East Coast. And what we can see is that that basis level got extremely strong during the recent droughts of 2018-2019 and still impacting, that drought was still impacting 2020. However, we did see, you know, still seeing strong basis levels even prior to the recent drought. So whilst overseas values are clearly going to still be a, a major driver for our prices just by virtue of the, the scale of our production versus population, we do think that they will, can, they will take a bit of a backseat in the future. It, and this is what we're talking about if we're looking at a long-term investment. Um, and again, again, we have seen that basis level trending higher even prior to those recent droughts. Um, the other thing to think about at the moment is when we actually go and further into the detail, Queensland as it is already remains a domestic market for, for New South Wales uh, grains. They have a lot of feedlots, a lot of piggeries, a lot of chickens, which effectively requires them to import on paper grain from New South Wales. But we expect that this pattern will, will go further and further south and into New South Wales, and we'll see northern New South Wales requiring larger volumes of grain from the southern parts of New South Wales and, and even South Australia and Victoria on a far more regular basis. So that's really just to give you a bit of a, an overview of how we're seeing demand and, and really how we're seeing uh, the marrying up between protein enterprises and grain enterprises. And we think it's important to potentially have an overview of both of them as, as a way of, of managing risk and also opening up some, some pretty strong opportunities. So if you're into cropping, it's important if you're investing in Australia to, to really consider the livestock. But conversely, if you're into livestock investments, it's probably a, a very good idea to, to, to keep an eye on, on what is happening in grain as well, as, as the two are very much uh, closely linked and, and are becoming more so. So I'm going to pass you off to Mark, who's going to talk a bit about the execution and some of the factors around uh, investment in, in, in agriculture in Australia. Thanks, uh, Matt and Andrew. <clears throat> some really good insights into the protein and grain markets in Australia. I think in 
I'll have a, 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 a look through what the financial and and uh, sort of asset appreciation implications are for the trends we're seeing and uh, drawing on some of the anecdotal information we're seeing across the elders network in terms of demand for certain types of assets. So, um, you know, we've seen very strong output growth in red meat protein production and a demonstrable competitive advantage that Australia holds in, in sheep meat uh, and lamb production which, um, which is likely to, uh, to continue. Um, demand is growing quite strongly around the world for our products. And I think it's also worth mentioning that, um, that uh, Australia uh, exports to a quite a diverse range of, of markets. So uh, in terms of sheep meat output. So we've got um, you know, major customers are in the Middle East, North Asia and North America, plus a whole swag of um, of consumers in between, plus a pretty solid domestic consumption as well. So um, the the rise of sheep meat production is some certainly has some exciting um, possibilities, uh, opportunities for for investment in Australia, uh, whether you're in the, in directly investing in that sector or uh, or through the grain market. We're also seeing a structural shift in the grain demand, as uh, as Andrew said. We're seeing a strong um, we're seeing strong growth in domestic consumption, which is largely inelastic to meet consumer expectations of of um, of consistency of supply. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds as we go forward. Um, all of this is sort of um, uh, realising in in strong um, financial performance for uh, Australian producers in the three sectors we're looking at, uh, red meat, uh, beef and sheep, and um, and also grains. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of the data that's available to have a look at the trend in um, in, in that. So we pulled together some, or we've delved into some of the ABARES farm surveys data from 1990, uh, looking at farm cash incomes and farmer reported um, asset uh, uh, values in, in land and fixed improvements. Um, it's probably worth just noting that it's, it's the trend that we're interested in here rather than the absolute values because they do vary quite a bit from region to region and it's a pretty, a pretty broad sort of bag of, um, of sheep properties, cattle properties and grain properties we're looking at. In addition to the ABARES data, which is reported in real terms, um, we've got some uh, rural bank farm values data as well to uh, to look at what the actual growth in real transactions has been in nominal terms uh, across these sectors as well. And there's, as you can see, there's um, some pretty strong growth. So starting off with the ABARES data in terms of sheep farm cash incomes and, um, and uh, the value of land and fixed improvements, we can see that um, from about 2007, eight, there's been a very strong growth in trend coinciding with the, um, with the, with the input, uh, with, the, with the growth of, of output, uh, albeit with a bit of variation around the, uh, the 2019 drought. However, very fortunately, we're in a, a good position seasonally this year on the East Coast, and we expect those farm incomes to, uh, to bounce back quite, quite solidly and, and output to continue, although, in terms of output of uh, red meat, we, we really haven't seen a major disruption. It's been um, pretty consistent because we've been able to rely on grain. Um, so, and uh, if you look at the rural bank data, there's some pretty solid long-term growth uh, potential in these in these in in, in sheep meat, uh, and a, a quite a significant spike in uh, more recent five-year uh, average annual growth rates. Um, we're also seeing across the the, the board uh, greater increase, uh, greater interest in mixed farming operations. That is, um, uh, the ability to produce sheep and cattle and uh, and grain as well on the on the same asset from um, from a number of different quarters. Um, the uh, the strength in the the uh, domestic market for for land is is, is quite strong as, as you can see and driven by those um, you know excellent performances in uh, farm cash incomes in terms of beef similar story oops um, in terms of beef we can see a similar sort of story will be probably coming from a slightly ha uh, higher base in terms of um, farm fixed improvements and land values um, similar story with farm cash incomes growing quite strongly, but with that uh, with that variability around the 2019 drought. 
And again, the rural bank, um, rural bank uh, uh, transaction histories are showing pretty solid growth across the board there. What we've used is uh, with, with these two data sets and the cropping is, is New South Wales as a proxy for what's happening on the east coast of Australia. Um, where we have, uh, you know, a number of mixed farming operations, sheep, sheep you know, dedicated operations and beef operations as well. Um, we've also just picked a few of the sort of representative areas in the rural bank data uh, to demonstrate what actual transaction history and, and trend has been like. Um, so uh, again, you know, good, good, strong growth in those sectors. Um, in terms of crop, uh, we can see a similar story as well. Again, um, you know, good, solid uh, growth in farm cash incomes from 2008-9, uh, translating into demand for um, for assets uh, to expand production. And again, similar similar story in the rural bank data as well. So, you know, there's strong correlation which supports the, uh, the the sort of changes that Matt and Andrew were talking about in in the market in terms of output uh, and export proportions uh, across across the board. There, uh, what are the implications for uh, for investing in Australian agriculture? Uh, protein output uh, is great is is growing and creating strong demand for assets, and that's I think that's pretty clear in the charts we've, show, we've shown. What we're seeing is demand for grazing land appears to be strongest in the higher rainfall areas uh, where there's potentially a little lower climate variability and um, uh, sort of above 600 mils rainfall annual in those temperate, rain, in, in those temperate areas are, uh, seem to be a bit of a sweet spot at the moment and showing great interest. And that's reflected anecdotally in, um, in, in buyer demand and, and inquiry. We're seeing um, uh, a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, I think that there's just some geographic diversity that some investors want to build into their portfolios. And for standalone assets, um, those areas represent a, um, uh, you know, a, a more secure, uh, less variable sort of income. Uh, in terms of portfolio construction, we're seeing um, perhaps a little more interest in, in assets dedicated to particular parts of the, uh, the production chain um, where we've seen sort of assets dedicated to breeding being put into the portfolio, growing and then finishing uh, and finishing being being able to take uh, the animals through to processing weights on predominantly grass and trying to reduce the reliance on, on grain. Uh, we're also seeing um, uh, a strong interest in proximity to re reliable sources of grain and livestock processing. So. With, uh, with transport costs uh, being quite a significant part of the, 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 the sort of the, the total value of final output, um, clustering properties and, and finishing uh, operations around um, sources of grain and processing facilities and then export, um, or export supply chains is a pretty important part of a consideration and investment strategy. And Matt's, um, Matt's comment on Western Victoria is an important one where it's an emerging or has been for some time an emerging grain area that is relatively low variability of output um, and, uh, and uh, you know, of interest to protein producers uh, being able to secure uh, supplies of grain in that area through, through climate cycles. I think the other thing that's probably worth, worth um, noting is that um, We've got uh, some really exciting technology that's coming through the pipeline to support productivity growth in grazing enterprises in Australia um, through things like remote sensing of pasture volume and quantity, uh, uh, remote uh, tracking of animals to match pasture supply and animal demand and improve um, identity preservation uh, through, the, through the supply chain. So. That's just a little bit of a tip of the iceberg of some of the technology that's emerging, <coughs> which will uh, lead to, I think, some pretty solid uh, productivity growth opportunities in the sector as well. So, you know, in conclusion, um, uh, protein output is growing, sheep and, and lamb output in particular is growing strongly with good prospect, prospects for, for future growth and a diversified uh, market for for the output. Um, growth in protein is increasing domestic demand for grain 
and largely this 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 demand is is fixed in nature to meet the the consumer requirements for uh, consistent quantity and quality of product and uh, this is li likely to uh, underpin um, Australian grain prices. I think it's also worth noting too that um, you know we have um, very limited access to grain imports uh, due to very strong biosecurity uh, regulations. So, um, you know, we have a rising demand, we have a, uh, a fixed demand um, that is reliant almost exclusively on, on domestic grain sources. That might change a little bit as demand starts to increase, but um, our biosecurity laws are very rigid and um, in place for good reason. Um, I think, uh, what we've seen here is that the growth in protein demand in Australia is likely to continue to see strong demand for assets that can produce um, protein, but also grain uh, assets that can support the, uh, the continued production of grain. So thanks very much for um, listening to the presentation. I'll now hand over to Kate to, um, to facilitate the, uh, the Q&A session. Great, thanks so much, Mark. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, yep. perfect. Um, thank you for all of those incredible insights. Uh, to everyone listening, just to let you know, um, the team has been kind enough to make this presentation available for download. So after um, I'm able to post the video to globalaginvesting.com slash webinars, I'll send you all a note about that and you'll be able to, to download and, and be able to really dig into some of those charts. Um, I think I want to start, Mark, uh, with asking, you mentioned consumer expectations in that last slide, and it's something that just came into my mind, because certainly you know, here in the States, we, you know, there is a premium put on grass-fed beef and grass-fed lamb. So I wonder if um, this necessity of, of finishing with grain more and more is going to do anything to diminish perception of quality or perception of value at the consumer end. That may be too far downstream, but just something I was curious about. Yeah, Kate, it's, it's a really good point. Um, I think that there is certainly room for, and, and look, it's a wonderful opportunity actually for Australian producers to differentiate themselves, um, which is a part of the sort of the branding, the branding story and the the, the competitive advantage that Australia does have, we do have the capacity to finish on grass um, in, 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 in most seasons uh, where, and grain can support perhaps earlier stages of production. Um, so we'll still see a, an increase in grain demand, but it might be for, and, and, and certainly could be for finishing of stock, um, but where a producer is aiming to grass finish stock uh, and, and uh, promoted as a grass-fed product, then grain will probably be used in earlier stages of the um, the, the production cycle to support breeding or or um, uh, other parts of the operation. So, um, and and also I think technology and improvements in um, pasture production are going to see um, uh, greater levels of um, security of output from grass-fed systems, uh, particularly around uh, matching sort of. Uh, supply and demand for animals and, and pasture production. Um, and also, I think that um, we might see a little bit more water used to, to irrigate some finishing systems, although that's probably a, probably a much niche area of the market. Okay, thanks. Um, you, what I thought was interesting about this presentation specifically is the focus on uh, internal demand within Australia. I remember, you know, six or seven years ago when we were doing our um, Global Ag Investing Asia conference and our, our European conference, a lot of the talk about the opportunity in Australia was sort of feeding um, China and Asia. So I wonder if, I don't know who's the best to address this, but if you could talk a little bit about um, trade tensions maybe with China and how that has affected uh, the markets as we stand now. I'll let you take that one, Matt. No, thanks, Matt. Yeah, the, the good old trade question um, one. Um, look, we have had, obviously, um, in recent times, we have had some issues, uh, particularly with our um, trade relationship with China. Um, I think with the changing um, administration we're seeing in America, I think that has 
um, implications as well where Australia fits into the, the broader um, kind of diplomatic trade um, piece. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, I guess unofficially, um, uh, there's been some um, some barriers and constraints put around a, a couple of key products, uh, key agricultural products um, that Australia um, exports to China. Um, and so the, the official word is that the, the concerns around that isn't to do with um, anything diplomatic or political, but obviously it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one to, to navigate. Um, certainly some parts of the industry, in particular the barley um, sector, uh, the beef sector and the wine sector at the moment, uh, have been quite um, or quite concerned about the developments we've seen with those tensions. Um, the the community here is is hopeful that um, with a with a change to the American administration that looks fairly fairly certain now, um, and and potentially a, 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 a reset back to maybe more normalised diplomatic and trade um, relationships, maybe less protectionist type style. Um, but I think the Australian sector here is hopeful um, that we can uh, use that reset within North America and China to, to also kind of reset our own individual relationships. Um, you know, obviously our proximity to Asia and the growth we've seen in that and, and the growth we've seen in China in particular, um, Australia uh, for some parts of the agricultural sector have been um, heavily geared towards um, China as a key client. Um, so it is an imperative, I think, for, for many parts of the Australian agricultural space that have that, um, have that relationship that we need to make sure um, we're back on uh, a much better, more favourable footing than what we're currently on at the moment. Great. Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, oh, do you want to add something, Mark? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I just thought I'd just <clears throat> pick up on the the, um, uh, the 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 fact that in, in, in sheep meat consumption is, is very diverse around the world um, and Australia has very large consumption of uh, its product in in the Middle East, for instance, um, which is you know rapidly growing, very large middle class, wealthy GDP per capita for most of the region, um, has at times struggled to supply its own needs. So um, you know that's a that's a good market. North America is a very strong market for Australian output, uh, sheep and lamb output as well, and and Northern Asia and China. So we've got great diversity of, uh, of, of consumption of our product, which is uh, very useful when we're seeing some tensions in, in some, some areas of our trade. Right, that's great. Thank you for adding that. Um, you mentioned, Matt, I think it was the, the certain restrictions on, on particular imports. For some of the audience who may be you know, looking at Australia as a potential destination for dollars and wanting to understand that a little bit better. Can you, can you explain those restrictions a bit more? Um, I think probably, Andrew, you might be more placed to explain Sorry, this Andrew. scenario around Bali. Yeah, yeah, Bali is one of the big ones. Okay. This is on the, the, the restrictions on imports of, of feed. Uh, so at present, we did import uh, some wheat during uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, which was probably the first time in, in 10 years since the, since the last drought. But it's an extremely costly exercise to import wheat or, or barley or any form of whole grains. So we, we, don't, we, we don't see that becoming all that much easier in the near term because there's a very strong farmer lobby group who clearly it's in their interest to not have imports of, of, of grains. Uh, because by allowing grains imported, it reduces that domestic basis or the premium versus the rest of the world. So we, we would expect that uh, that won't become all that much easier for anyone to import in, in the near future, which then makes, because it's harder to import, but also the demand's increasing, then it continues to put pressure on that premium and, and increase that premium uh, because it is so hard to import. The reasons why it's so hard to import is, we've got, as Mark was saying, we've got very stringent biosecurity protocols. Um, for instance, um, you know, plans, extensive plans have to be put into place to import any whole grains. And, and it's an expensive process. It's time consuming. And it's, it's not all that feasible for, for a lot of companies. So we expect that work is unlikely to change significantly anytime in, in the near future. That may change 
in, in the longer term, but not, not nearby. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing I think, Andrew, in your portion of the presentation, you mentioned a, a little bit about um, longer supply chains maybe, or, or um, altered ones. Um, uh, and something I thought conspicuously absent from the entire presentation was COVID. And I know that here in the US, we may be a lot more consumed since you guys kicked it a while back. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, supply chain disruptions this year uh, due to COVID, whether there were any actually internally. Yeah, so I think from, I'll, I'll let Matt answer because it was probably more on, uh, on, on livestock. We, we sort of consciously didn't want to add COVID in because we thought everyone's a bit tired of it by now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's but, true. But yes, yeah, so we, we did see some supply chain disruptions in, in the very early stages at the, at the start of the year when it was a new thing. Uh, it doesn't feel like it was six months ago or nine months ago. It feels like it was about five years ago. But we had issues with uh, things like our reliance on chemicals or fertilizers from overseas, where there were a lot of concerns at that time that we wouldn't get the required chemicals or fertilizers to, to plant the crop adequately. Luckily, we it sort of didn't have a huge impact upon uh, our our cropping for this this current season, but it was it was a very big concern, and it has actually changed things or viewpoints within the country on how we are so reliant on our imports of, of various products and, and how I think like a pandemic can uh, can impact upon that. But we did see a lot of concerns probably in the last three months, four months, when it comes to uh, abattoirs, which Matt mm. can cover off on. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think too, um, Kate, that um, just before I touch on the abattoir situation was also, um, Andrew mentioned about the imports that we're reliant upon, but then being such an ex export focused nation too, um, some of the initial, um, when, when the, the world was going through that first stage of lockdown through kind of April, May, um, and the disruption to airline travel, um, there's quite a, a significant proportion, I think it's about 25% <coughs> of Australian product that used to piggyback the passenger flights. Um, wow. So we had, some, we had some issues there and obviously also concerns around getting just through normal port container transport um, arrangements too, that countries that were having disruptions to their, to their um, ports coming for incoming goods, um, there was some, you know, a bit of quick scrambling to make sure that there was, um, you know, the Australian government put on quite a few charter flights to get some of the more um, sensitive products like, you know, fresh seafood and horticultural stuff needed to get to destination quickly. Uh, so there was concerns there as an initial blip, um, but then later into the period uh, within just one part of Australia, so the southern state of Victoria um, had a second round of, of, of kind of COVID um, uh, spread. Uh, and, and so uh, while the rest of the country was kind of starting to come out of the initial phase, Victoria went into a, a second phase of lockdown um, and, and part of that spread, a bit like what happened in the US uh, where you had um, COVID impacting upon your beef and pork processing sector through April, May, uh, that necessitated some, some shutdown or some reduced shifts and, and obviously then a, a, a lower ability to, to um, process animals. Um, we also had that happen in Victoria. Um, now for, for the beef space, it was less problematic because Victoria, um, um, within Victoria, we slaughter about 20% of the, of the nation's beef. Um, so the bulk of the beef is in Queensland, New South Wales, and that, therefore the bulk of the processing is up there as well. Uh, but um, Victoria is quite a big processor of, of sheep meat. Um, and again, it's to do with part of that distribution of where the sheep are. And, and um, when we get the large amount of turnoff of lamb every season, a, a quite, a, quite a big proportion of that turnoff comes through that southern Victorian areas. So that's another reason why um, Victoria uh, processes about 50 or over 50% of Australian lamb um, slaughter each year is done in Victoria. Um, the second round of COVID there meant that um, abattoirs they got infected, quite a few were shut down for a period of a few weeks, but then the state government in Victoria required uh, that um, they reduced capacity, uh, workforce capacity down to 65%. So therefore they, you know, they couldn't um, um, slaughter as much. Um, it was only fortunate that that occurred during winter, which is our, normally our low season. So they managed to get through, but the big concern was um, that they were not able, if, if, if Victoria wasn't able to 
to um, get the COVID spread under control in time for spring, which is what we're in now, um, there would have been a, a big influx of lambs hitting the market that required processing. And, and without Victoria um, up near full capacity in, in terms of processing, we would have had a backlog of, of sheep, sheep and lamb to be, to be slaughtered. And, um, and as we saw in what happened in the US when you had your backlog of cattle and pork, it, it had a significant impact to price. Um, we were just fortunate enough that the, the government managed to get it under control in time, um, such that we're, we're pretty much back and up and running again. So, um, yeah, from, from a, if you compare what happened to Australia to a global perspective, we were very fortunate that the, the timing and the spread wasn't anywhere near as, as significant as what you experienced in the US. Right. So we've heard about Victoria, we've heard about New South, New South Wales and, and Queensland and how not to think of Australia as a country, but as a full continent. Um, I wonder in terms of maybe some of the data that was near the end of the, the presentation in terms of asset appreciation, um, should the investors be, when they're considering investing in Australia, um, does that differ quite a lot by region? How, how should the investors in the room be thinking about um, high asset price appreciation and what other factors may be contributing? Sure, Kate. Look, it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think we, we presented that the prospects for red meat um, demand around the world remain pretty strong. Australia has a demonstrable competitive advantage in terms of being a very large exporter of both sheep and beef and lamb meat. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we'll still, we'll continue to see strong fundamentals in those sectors um, with um, some, some pretty exciting opportunities and market diversity in sheep meat. Also seeing, you know, substantial sort of productivity gains that are being made and can be made in those areas, <coughs> in those, in those systems. So, from a from a sort of a an investment assessment um, process, you know fundamentals are good. The uh, the opportunity set in Australia is diverse um, to establish uh, in terms of, of, of um, exposure to the to these sectors. If uh, if you can get exposure to protein markets through through grain markets, but it is also solidly underpinned by. Um, the fact that it's a staple and continues to be in demand through through commodity cycles, um, the geographic diversity that Australia offers is is a really important consideration in um, in an investment thesis and 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 um, implementation. You know, we spoke about um, sort of high rainfall areas um, with with high rates of um, uh, sorry with low rates of climate variability, a very important consideration in constructing a portfolio. Um, and there's um, you know there, there's a number of sort of assets at scale through through those production categories and regions that are very attractive for um, for uh, for an investment strategy. Great. We don't have a ton of time left, but uh, as Americans often do, I'm going to make it about me again. It sounds like Matt um, thinks that the new administration coming in next year is going to be a positive change for international trade. What say you, Mark? Um, yes, we'll, we'll probably see a... <coughs> Who knows, really? But look, we'll probably see a... Um, perhaps a, a, a more uh, diplomatic approach to trade negotiations around the world. I think potentially some of the intent will remain in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the American role in, in the world and particular relationships with China, but it'll probably be a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more obvious, the a little bit less obvious the negotiations that are going on and perhaps a little, uh, a little bit more nuanced. Andrew, anything to add? Yeah, I guess it's probably, it's, it's probably easier for us to talk about it because we're not in the country and it's not, not personally affecting us. I've probably got a slightly different view on, on it that I'm not necessarily sure it will necessarily be as positive for trade as people expect. I, I, I agree with Mark and, and Matt that a more nuanced and diplomatic uh, attitude will form but I'm not necessarily sure the actual underpinning uh, will change all that much in that 
the actual, uh, when, when, I guess you've got Republicans that are in control of the Senate, I believe, or liable to be. It, it remains to be seen, but that's the most likely outcome, yes. And, and, and you've also got an environment where, let's be honest, the actual, the actual race to the election was actually pretty close. And it's, Very it's, it's, it, we're talking like a 50-50 country. And, and coming from Scotland, which is a 50-50 country on our own political issues, that always leads to tension. And, and I don't necessarily think that it will be a case that we can reverse that you know, protectionism that we've experienced over the past four years on China. I think they, there may be an unwinding, but I think it will be a slow process because Biden has to keep everyone happy, I guess. And I don't think that it's necessarily the, the positive view of China will, will be there for quite some time from, from the US. It just might be done in a slightly more diplomatic fashion, but the results potentially very similar. Yeah. It's a tall order keeping everybody happy. But just <laughs> to close out our time together, I would like, I guess, Mark, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit how elders rural services can keep all of our community happy? Can you just talk a little bit about um, what services you do provide and how you work with Thomas Elders uh, Markets? And um, just tell us a little bit more about the business. Sure, thanks, Kate. Um, look, we're probably the largest agribusiness company in Australia. We have um, 500 points of presence across the country. We have in excess of 300 experts in the field every day in every region uh, of Australian agriculture. Um, we have um, uh, uh, we have subsidiary companies like uh, Thomas Elder Markets that uh, produce independent, uh, high quality market intelligence and, and analytics. Um, you know, we have uh, operational expertise, we have investment expertise. We've got um, a huge amount of capability that we can bring to bear at, at any stage of the investment life cycle. Perfect. And I just, I, I have a link both to Thomas Elder Markets as well as Elders Rural Services on the webinar webpage, which again will be released um, just in a couple of hours once I get the video up for you. Um, I just wanna say thank you to Mark and Andrew and Matt for the incredible insights you provided today. And I'm, I, didn't introduce myself ever during this whole time. So I'm Kate Westfall. I'm the COO of Global Ag Investing. And I just feel thrilled to have smart friends like these. Um, thank you all for spending your time with us. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity.